Welcome to the Time Has Come podcast. My name is Graham Wardle, and I'm so excited to share this episode with you today. It was very insightful for me to listen back to it and review before I shared it with all of you. I learned a lot from just all the different perspectives and viewpoints and the passion and playfulness that Kerry brings to his life and he shared with me on this podcast. So I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all. We cover acting, movies, life, philosophy, the Ten Commandments, and even a little bit about the aliens. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy this podcast. The time has come for us all to welcome Kerry James. Kerry, thanks for coming out. How you doing? Graham, it's my pleasure, man, and I'm doing really well. It's uh, it's pretty cool being here on the island with you. Yeah. Now, you said you come to the island uh, quite often. Yeah, I'm here usually at least twice a month for weekends. My, yeah. my parents are, are on the island, and, um, well, I grew up here, so this is, it is You home. grew up on the island? The island is home. I mean, we moved away, but always came back before going anywhere else. Well, didn't your parents grow up, didn't your dad grow up with my mom in Mission? Yeah, my, my dad and your mom grew up together in Mission, like high school, the whole works and everything. Okay. Yeah. But then... When you were born, when you guys started living out here. I think we, yeah, we moved to the island. I was born here. On the oh, island. okay, okay. Yeah, down in Saanich. Well, I appreciate you coming out. Um, now, before we launch into this podcast, I'm excited about this one because we always talk deep stuff. Like we <laughs> yeah. go we go out there with, with our conversations, which I love. And I was excited to have you on because I know we can talk. We can get into stuff, right? So if we're getting crazy, like I'm going to try and go like, well, like let's, let's boil this down. Let's keep this simple. Cool. And let's try and make this relatable so that people listening can kind of join us on the yeah, ride. So it's a little bit for everybody. A little bit know? for everybody. No, yeah. just, just for our kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other day, you were talking with me, uh, you shared with me on a text about a memory that you had. And I had shared with you years ago, a story about me falling off one of those chin-up bars. And you texted me and you said, dude, I just remembered that story. And it came back in like a vision. And like you felt, you felt these things. You, you remember the smell you said. And I asked you, like, how often does that happen? You're like, I think you told me all the time. Yeah, it usually happens at least a few times a day. Is that something that you, that's normal for you? Like, how do you manage that in your regular life? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, is it, it's been a process of being okay with it. Because it is overwhelming when it happens. It's not always... Is it very exciting to have easy access to your memory? To be able to re recall things, like, not just to the point of remembering them, like, watching a movie, but actually feeling them happening as though it is present again? But then yeah. still fully aware that you're obviously, you know, now and not in that memory, but... Yeah, it's 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 uh it's been a long process of growth in trying to be comfortable with it all because it is very much it it steals your psyche away from the present in a lot of ways. Do you use that skill or that ability in your craft of acting? Like is that something you can tap into to you know get into a scene? I've always found acting is thrilling and fun, but it's also always been easy. And I think the reason it's become like come so easy and natural for me is because for me, make believe literally is enough. And there isn't actually anything past make believing required to act because, well, it just becomes real for enough for my body and enough for my psyche that it's just yeah. actually happening. I mean, obviously I say that, but it's, you know, like there's my, my safeties are up. It's not like things are going to get dangerous and I no longer remember yeah, the real yeah. world is happening, but yeah. Huh. I think it might have even been part of what initially drew me to acting was just the fact that I had that natural aptitude already. To make believe. To make believe. Yeah. From what I've read, a lot of our memory is made up. Like we don't actually remember actually what happened. We make up a lot of what we think we remember. I've read a lot about that too. And, and that's um, like when you, when you shared that story with me and the memory came back to me, it was a physical overwhelm. The sensation of you yeah. landing on your knees on a concrete floor. <laughs> and of course, so I know that that memory not only is it not mine it happened to you not me yeah. but the way that my mind works and the way that all minds works or can is i can relive that event as though i were you and see it happening like a movie at the same time so i know that it's not my memory but it, it feels was, real it feels real and yeah. that was so visceral that it restored the entire memory of actually being in your room on the day that you told me that this had happened to you yeah yeah wow dude because they say, like, I don't think anything that happens is remembered the same by any one person. Whoever no, it can't was there be. present, they have an yeah. entirely different scope on how it actually was. I, I think there's enough room for that. For sure. I think it's fascinating that you have that clarity of memory where you get those visceral feelings. Like, that only happens for me if I s smells will, like, really trigger that. Like, if I smell something, 
that's like a cologne or like a perfume, I should say, of like a girlfriend back in high school, I'll be like, oh, that smell. I remember that girl. And it brings me right back. Everybody jumps right to the old factory for bringing back memory and the smells. But everybody, I, I, I would argue this, that everyone has the same natural intuition towards memory recall through their body um, and often just don't realize it. My proofing for that is when was the last time someone told you that they hit their shin or stubbed your toe and you didn't go, ah, Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I'm using pain and fear as the immediate route into accessing those kind of things, but it, it's available through joy and laughter and everything else, but everybody can empathize through pain and bring back yeah. their own experiences as though they're happening. How do you think somebody can enhance that ability? Well, I think any sort of self-help designed to help to get to know yourself. I mean, you could simply go become and be an actor because it's the same kind of work or learn about psychology or meditation or yoga. Anything that helps you map who you are will eventually open up these traits inside the human psyche and give you access to them. You think so? Like if you spend enough time working on self-acceptance, you're not likely to stand in the way of any of your own memories. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> But Dropping it, bombs, man. But once we build up a certain persona of who we are and commit to that, odds are that, you know, like a silly part of yourself from your past that you might actually be connected to an infinite amount of memories is just lost because you blocked it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, uh, tell me uh, and for everyone listening why you got into acting. How did you get into it? And uh, what juices you about it today? Well, okay, it's not a very classic story. I okay. don't think that I was in love I don't think with there acting. is a classic yeah. story. Is there a classic like, story? I didn't, I, I, you know, <laughs> everyone always says, like, oh, I love acting. I just, I always knew I wanted okay, to yeah, yeah, I that's a classic win. story. But I'm yeah. like, I don't, um, I have no idea. I don't think, man, I think I've just admitted to myself that I've been lost in this life at a much younger age than most people. And acting was the only thing that really was a disguised form of figuring out who the hell you are. And then you could get paid at for doing and have a buttload of fun and try a bunch of experiences you would otherwise not have. I don't even see it as an art form anymore so much as just like a way of life. What do you mean by way of life? Like a way that you live? Yeah. I think acting is really unique because it, uh, it pulls the mind in so many directions at once. And when I say mind, I include the entire like mind, body, soul complex into that. There aren't very many things in this world that force you to be who you are, like, you know, Graham Wardle on set, but then you are also playing a character, Ty, yeah, yeah. honoring that reality. Yeah. So your body is having a truthful fight or flight response to whatever the character is experiencing, whatever emotions those are. But at the same time, Graham is still aware he exists. He hasn't forgotten who he is. And he also has to be aware that there are camera angles and blocking and marks that he has to hit, be aware of his light. Yep. And then he's also not forgotten about the things outside of work and outside of acting going on in his life. So that is a lot of directions to pull the psyche in at once, especially if you do it as frequently as you do. And I think that that, though the purpose for doing it was to act and to make a show and all that, I think the unexpected result of that is just is learning about who you are. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, how you work, how you think. And I think pulling your... Your mind in that many directions is a recipe for an existential crisis, but I think that an existential <laughs> crisis is a really important thing, and I think everyone should have at least one. Mm. So for you, what keeps you in it is the exploration of that question of who am I and like discovering that. I guess so. I think the reason I stay in acting, though, is um, I'm just too chicken to quit. And when I say that, I don't mean like that I want to quit acting, but I mean, if I could, if there was another means of actually living in this world, I might be more interested in, in what that is than acting. Living in the imaginative world or living in what world? I frame this. This is a difficult conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, we're a very young species. Humans are really new. It was just yesterday we were still bashing each other on the head and in some places in the world we in still the, are. In the whole context of yeah, human in history. Yeah, the whole context of human history. We're very young, but I believe, and maybe this is detrimental or some would find it detrimental, but exploring within the first world as I have, um, thinking about things like who am I, how do I work, I, I think it's just... I don't know. It's a recipe for unraveling. There's no way around it. Mm. And, and once you see things unravel and I'm not saying like, you know, this is 
the matrix or anything like that. I just mean you really start to notice the things that are missing from life and things like ah. booking a role or having a house or even a wife and kids become extraneous in value and, and the absurdity of it all presents itself because you're just painting by numbers. And when you finally realize like, hey, what I should do next is actually up to me. Suddenly there's a lot of options and, uh, and a lot of things can seem pretty scary and daunting. Do you feel that that has come to you, that insight, that awareness has come to you through this uh, journey of acting and of exploring yourself through different characters? It's, it's opened you up to ask those questions? Certainly it's not unrelated. I think it's all part and parcel. I mean, I think anyone who gets into acting with a healthy interest in it, like you and I both did, is bound to find themselves thinking about this stuff. And there's lots of people who get into acting because they would like to enjoy fame or be successful just for the heck of it. And they kill it and they crush it. They treat it like a business and they're masters at it. So I'm sure lots of lots of them never have to worry about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or and maybe they do, they just don't talk about it. Yeah, or they, they shut yeah. it down, you know. Um, so, you know, I'm curious to hear about, I know you've told me a little bit about the scripts that you're writing, but in terms of, your view on the world and the types of stories that you want to see in the world today. What kind of stories do you want to see in the next 10 years? You know, what kind of movies, you know, there's big movies like The Matrix that shaped culture and opened ideas up. What movies does Kerry James want to see in the future being made? And, or do you want to be a part of those movies? Well, I'd definitely like to be a part of those movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in both questions, what movies do you want to make and what movies do you want to see? I want to make fun movies and I want to use writing and, and the film industry is an outlet for creating fun movies that inspire me that I can pepper full of my own subtext and philosophy. And the movies I want to watch are movies that are made by people that want to watch their own fucking movies. Like Quentin Tarantino, man, he makes yeah. movies for himself and nobody else. But shouldn't everybody be doing that? Because presently we, we live in a world where everything goes through, I don't know what you call it, like, uh, like, um, I don't know, filter. Yeah, like a filter. That's a good word for it. And and just, it's a business. And yeah. so they figure out what will work best for that business model. And there's a time and a place for that, obviously. But I think the stories that are told by by people who are just passionate about their story, whether whether they have a real heavy reason for why it needs yeah. to be told, or they're just like, I don't know, it was fun for me. Life moves too fast now. No movie is ever going to mean what it used to. Um even even the best movie in the world today in three years will be scratching her head trying to remember the title of it. Because of the rate of consumption, how much? Because of the rate of the consumption and also yeah. there are no unique stories left. I've read enough fiction, nonfiction, and philosophical, uh, theological, and, and mythological texts to know that they are all the same story over and over and over. So rather than getting behind the fact that you think your personal mythos is important enough that you should share it all with the world, why not just have a little fun and wink at everybody? And I think that's a lot more earnest and impactful way of sharing what you do believe in rather than hitting the nail on the head. And doesn't that also make it more unique because it's coming from your view of how this is fun. Yes. And really that's not repetitive. All filmmakers can bring to a project nowadays to make a story unique because every story has been told Yeah, is the tone yeah. the style they tell it with. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's cool, man. That's cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it got me thinking, dude. You got me thinking. That's great. So one of the things when I was thinking about naming this podcast I was like, well, what do I want to call this, you know? And the name that came to me was The Time Has Come. And The Time Has Come just was like this idea of around emergence. What's emerging? What's coming up? What's been in sitting on the back burner that needs to, to emerge? What, what do you feel is emerging? What do you feel, Kerry, is, is coming forward with in this 2020, this big year? <laughs> oh, oh, buddy. I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> That's a big um, question. Man, I'm working on the little things. We all okay. go through a lot in life. I am still trying. I just want to figure out how to feel authentically myself. I do. I, I, yes, I would love to book a show. There's a lot of things that I would love to have happen. All of those things that I would like to have happen relate purely to making my experience of this life more comfortable, not necessarily more rich in joy or rich in sorrow, just more comfortable. So I would love additional creature comforts <laughs> while I go through <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. very confusing experience of life. Mm. Yeah. And as far as emerging in 2020, oh, everything comes in waves. I have not had an easy few years at all, and I don't necessarily see the other side of that yet 
But I'm also very comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. The rules I try to live by these days are never be doing anything that bores you because you should be able to find anything interesting. Like us, driving down a road, it's like, what is really the point of racing to our destination if we can't already just be enjoying the drive? I firmly believe that, and that's helped me stay present and um, also just willing to continue living during some of the really tough times where it would be easier to just feel numb. And number two is when life does force you to do things you don't want to do, like work, then at least have the courage to remember that you are the lead character of the novel of your life, and this is the last chapter before things get interesting. Damn. Damn. <laughs> I've heard that said another way, but I like that. It's like uh, before things get interesting. When was the last time you read a novel that didn't start out with and character A was having a regular day? Right. Fumbling through the things that they didn't enjoy doing just before. Like that's life. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Very cool. So in your life right now, I know a lot of people they have goals and they have, you know, dreams or aspirations and stuff that they work towards. But I get the sense that you don't necessarily have that. I don't think you necessarily point towards goals or, or map out a 10 year plan. I would love to be able to have one so that I could <laughs> tell people it and just be like, look, I do. But no, I don't, I don't even know what that is, man. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I have no real goals or no real ambitions. They're like, there's lots of things I'd like to do. And, and that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with goals or that I don't shoot for things when opportunities come up. Yeah. When an opportunity arrives, I find a way to make it happen for me, whatever that means. That's a real living in the flow, like living in the moment. Yeah, and I mean, who has a 10-year plan that doesn't include finding a house, falling in love, right, blah, right, blah, right. blah. Like those things, that's a given. That's everybody's 10-year <laughs> right, plan. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, as far as like, there's no one role or one project I could work on that would make me feel better about myself. To be honest, when we both worked on Heartland, like uh, in season two, when I came on, like, and, and they wanted to keep me around. Like, I was like, wow, I did it. I made it. Right. That's what everyone says. And yeah, there was like, there was like a good solid day or two of that shine, that feeling where you're like, I am alive. Dun, 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 this is happening. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like, well, no, now we're back to the same feeling as before it had happened. Yeah. 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 So I, I've just come long, like far enough to realize like no, no one thing's going to do it for me. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that I've been playing with as an idea, and I want to hear your opinion on this, is what's the spiritual benefit? What's the spiritual growth or the strength that will come of me achieving this goal? And that's a way that I've framed goals or targets so that I don't get hung up on it being my way. I go, if I want to make a feature film or something, the spiritual profits of doing that, of actually going through that process, well, man, like all the, the strengthening of communication, the strengthening of my resolve, the, the faith in a higher power and the way things are supposed to be. There's See, so that's what's so beautiful about you is exactly, if you're going to make a feature film, the enjoyable part is the process, not the finished film. Right. Yeah. But so many people get hung up on the finished product. The they goal. Want, they yeah, want to see the movie done. But it's like, yo, if you didn't live through and remember and stay present for all of those meetings and this and scouting locations all the way down to shooting and on the day and then post production. If you didn't enjoy that, your movie, you will hate it. <laughs> you hustle through it to get to the end and be like, oh, now I'm supposed to feel great. Yeah. And you, you missed it. <laughs> you missed it. You missed, <laughs> you missed all the of thing. the fun parts. <laughs> Yeah, so in that frame, in that context, would you set goals in that sense? Would that be a, a something mm. that would work for you? If like, well, I'm going to set a goal, but really what I'm after is those profits, those spiritual profits. I think that's very much how I live. That's how you live already. Yeah. You just and, don't phrase and, it that uh, way. And I guess I, I, I guess I set goals. They're just really small goals. Like my goal is to do at least a charcoal drawing, at least, at least every second night. Be, not because I want to be a great charcoal artist, but because every time I put charcoal on paper, I write more. I work uh, out more. I think more. So it's all related down the line. So there's no way that having the goal of doing this thing that can sometimes feel real, feel like it feel very frustrating. I don't want to do this right yeah. now, but it's something I make matter and I do do it. And there is reward. I love that because the play, like it's playful to you, right? When you're doing charcoal art, yeah, it's playful. It's playful. You're it's not, you're not play. like getting pressure. You're no. not like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not even a charcoal artist. Yeah. So it's, it's largely terrible, but the point isn't to be a great charcoal artist. Yeah. It's just gets you in that state of play. Exactly. Where I'm willing to actually let creativity flow forth. Mm. Even if most of it's garbage, some of it will be gold. Does that take courage though on your part just to kind of create and express that way 
vulnerably because it's it's you know, is is that vulnerable for you? Is that is that tough? Vulnerability becomes more comfortable the more time you spend doing it. Nobody ever did anything courageous without being vulnerable first. Being brave and being full of courage is not the absence of fear. It's literally willing to stand in how afraid you fucking are. And, uh, and vulnerability is that state. I mean, anyone who ever stood in front of a tank or was part of a huge peace protest, mm -hmm. they were terrified but willing to be vulnerable. And that's why things work and have effects and, and the rest of the world remembers it. So, yeah, it's very vulnerable, but I like it. That's something that I'm working on right now is stepping into that because the pressure to create kills the fun. Like if you were yeah. say, if you were to wake up every morning and be like, oh, I have to write, I have to do my charcoal art, I have to do it, I have to be successful, it's, it's not going to be fun. But see, this You're was the trick. Your joy. <laughs> the trick was, is I took something like charcoal because it's fun, but it can be quick. It's something you can force yourself to do even if you're frustrated. And that is such a small doable thing that you can manage that half hour of frustration. And even if it fails, it doesn't matter. But the irony is you've still strengthened your relationship with say writing later in the evening or whatever else actually matters. That's self-expression. Yeah. So it's just about honing self-expression. So what advice would you give to young artists, young creative types that are wanting to get that momentum going is, is that to find their own charcoal art yeah whatever it is for some people it's uh, morning pages for some people it's painting for some people it's it's athleticism some people need yoga or uh boxing even mm. to start channeling those juices but whatever it is for you go get find those it. juices flowing as long as it's not something super creepy <laughs> <laughs> what's what you said morning pages I, i've never heard that before oh, what is um, morning pages um the artist's way very popular book i'm sure a, a lot of viewers who are Going I have the, the book upstairs. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, the artist way exercise number one recommendation is to write morning pages, which is 20 minutes of freehand journaling in the morning. But you don't think about what you're going to write. You just let it come pouring out. Don't read it back. Close the book. The point is it gets those juices going so that yeah. on another activity like your job or the script you're really working on is right. more accessible to you. Genius. It gets, yeah, I can see that how you take the pressure off and you get in that flow momentum. And once you're in the momentum, it's e much easier. Exactly. You don't have to overcome well, that. And you've been doing it enough that you're fearless in just letting a paragraph pour out and mm. potentially having to delete it. No big deal. What do you think about this concept of alter egos of stepping into different personas? How do you see the stepping into your, your role, the characters you play in terms of the psyche and in terms of how you do that? Is that something that you, comes easy to you? Okay, this is my trick. Everybody's different. I have never played a role where I have not been myself. I am always just myself, but the character has had a different life story than me. So Caleb, for example, he's just me, except he didn't grow up with the influences that I had. He grew up rural and with horses and around cowboys. So he's just me affected by that. That's it. If I were going to go play the Joker, I would play the Joker as Carrie James affected by that upbringing, which also, you know, like if a character is some from somewhere different, well, it affects everything, your voice, all of it. You know that that person grew up eating different than you. It's going to change who you are. It's as silly as like the, the, the cliche of putting on your character's shoes changes how you walk, talk. It fucking works. And, um, and that's all I do. And, and I guess I, I, I didn't learn... Like I didn't figure this out. I just, I, a lot of the actors that I admire the most, they seem to be always doing that. And it occurred to me and I went, oh, they're just always themselves under a set of different circumstances. When you're stepping into those characters, versions of you that are just living a different backstory, is there a moment for you that you're like, now I'm this character? Is it like putting on the boots? Is it like chewing a piece of grass in your mouth like what is there a trigger or is it a slow gradual it's a bit of a slow it's sometimes between getting my hair done and the makeup and getting a wardrobe <laughs> yeah. the next thing you know you're on set and in the back of your own mind you're like i am not representing myself at all today i'm not having conversations i would normally have i'm not uh, i'm not offering any of my like even my political views change depending on characters uh, when people on set get to know me they're not getting to know me i'm halfway in already to whoever i'm representing like caleb has very different opinions than i do whereas a lot of people on set that know me after you know in between action and cut like you know when we're just hanging out they probably think i'm very different than i actually am mm. because you got to admit like even you and i like we get 
we become way more ourselves when we're when we're here on the yeah. island than than uh, Ty and Caleb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that uh, you know, for me, stepping into the the boots, I had a pair of motorcycle boots that I would never wear because they're really heavy and clunky. <laughs> but I, they look cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when I put those on, I'm like, I would never wear these. So that's like, to me is like a trigger. So do you notice little things in your mind, like your psychology towards what you would and would prefer change slightly? Cause Ty has slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Like what you yeah. even have for lunch that day. Uh, no, I mean, when it comes to eating, I like, I'm taking care of the body of Graham so that he can do his job. Oh, that's, you smart. know, cause I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, there's some actors that do that. They starve themselves to get into the role and do all these crazy things. And I'm like, kudos, man. Like that's, I, that's next level. I think that takes the fun out of acting <laughs> and that seems awful. Maybe they have fun doing it, but I can't see why that would be fun. So there was a radio interview and I must've heard this like 15 years ago. It was, he was on the radio and they're talking to Christian Bale and it was about the machinist. Right. And I know the radio host is like, oh, like you lost so much weight for this role. It's incredible. He's like, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I did this. And it's like, oh, yeah. And like you were down to like uh, like half an apple and a can of tuna a day. He's like, yeah, yeah. It was like really challenging. It was really important for me to get into this role. Al Pacino is on the radio show as well. And he, he pops in. He goes, I played a cancer patient once. Guess how much weight I lost. <laughs> And, Al, and the host is like, oh, uh, uh, how much weight did you lose for the role, Mr. Pacino? And he goes, fucking none, because I'm an actor. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Like, it was like 20 years ago, man. It's, but, yeah, I mean, that's just two different approaches. Like, I don't, I mean, I, don't I love. Think, I don't think we should be risking or compromising physical health or safety for uh, something as frivolous as a television show or movie, which will be, man, all the best. What do you think they would say, though? What do you think? Uh, why would someone do that? Is it just to show off, you think? Or do you think they believe that this is the best way to translate this story, is to show people? I feel like maybe they might argue that it's the best way to translate the story and for it was for that. Yeah. But I think if you picked at them and picked at them, you'd get down to the root of the fact that they're just compelled to explore human experience and it isn't something otherwise they would do or be familiar with. And so maybe they just can't say no to the opportunity. I mean, losing an enormous amount of weight for a role, if, if Marvel called you tomorrow and was like, yo, will you gain 40 pounds of muscle for this role? Would you say no? And what's the difference? Well, 40 pounds of muscle, that's a lot of muscle. That's like, that would, that couldn't, you couldn't do that like in a year. Would you? Oh, that's steroids, <laughs> I guess. I don't yeah. ask Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> Does he do steroids? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see the, the bulking up possibly being a bit more healthy, but maybe not, you know, yeah, I don't know. The thing is, I don't really know the science. Of I don't either. know the science either. I know for me, it looks very uncomfortable. And I hate the idea of going back to my, my hotel room after work to be in further discomfort. Cause I've kind of with you. Um, I just think that that compromises your overall ability to act instead mm -hmm. of, yeah. And more power to those people if they want to do it. Like it's a free kind, you know, free world. Uh, it should be a free world. It should be people, people should be free to live to how they want to live. I think for me, and I'm, I'm guessing for you too, is it's more about like the experience of having fun and enjoying that process and telling stories that you enjoy telling. Cause I think that comes across yeah. to audiences when they're watching you on screen, they're going, this guy looks like he's having a fun time. I usually am. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that translates to a story that is going to be much more enjoyable. And to some degree, I also think that's what makes certain actors more likable when you're watching them. You're like, this person looks like they're enjoying their life. Yeah. And you pick up on that like frequency or that like energy. And I see that as like a, a byproduct or a hidden benefit to watching movies with certain types of actors. You watch them and it's like a meditation on a state of being. Yeah. You I know? completely agree. And it can help you in ways that you, you don't even know, but it's like, it's like a tuning tuning a guitar or tuning fork or, you know, and those characters or those actors are emitting a state of being a frequency and the audience picks up on that and they can almost tune to it. They can tune to that state of being that level of awareness or you can definitely feel enjoyment when of life present. And you, if you watch, it, a yeah, lot yeah, of, yeah. If you watch a lot of shows, I like to call it when I watch TV with my friends is like when, um, when a show's gone on long enough, like they're in season three and the lead who's in every, every single scene, they start 
acting with a certain style of delivery and a certain style of breath work. I call it craft service acting because you know that that actor is literally <laughs> waiting for cuts so that they can finish their coffee. Or, and, and, uh. and, and it happens to all of us. It happens to any actor that's going to be in a project for such a long duration of time. And we, we, we live to get to know different characters. If you become one for 12 years, like we kind of have. Right, right, right. Uh, you get a little tired of them. Right. And maybe uh, you start to phone it in a bit because that's when you really start to notice that you're not paying enough attention to your own life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, the, the especially in TV, when you're doing, you're showing up every day, feature films are different, right? You're going to take two months, maybe, maybe tops. And three, why not? Four or five months. Everything. Yeah. And you can it. do that. But when you're doing like Heartland, we used to shoot it was seven months of the year. And, and uh, you were there every day, every day, every single day, you know, almost every day. But yeah. And then you're doing that. It's like, like you said, it's like how you take for granted your shower. You go camping for a week yeah. and you come back you're like the shower's amazing. I will never, <laughs> I will never forget about for granted. This. Yeah. You know, you're acting in a, in a show, you're doing the same character over and over again. And there's going to be times where you're tired or, you know, something happens or whatever. <coughs> and that is a, a mailed in performance or a, a what you, what'd you call it? Craft service craft, acting? Craft service acting. <laughs> Yeah, and I yeah. mean, shit. I try really hard not to do that. Hey, I think <laughs> I've been guilty of it too. Like it happens. It yeah. does happen. Not yeah. every scene is going to be one that you're proud of. Yeah, film, uh, TV is 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 more like a marathon where you got to maintain that focus, and that's why I think about eating is like imperative. When I the last few years on the show, I still bring my food to set because I'm like I need to know exactly what, you're what energy I'm going to get because I need to you. depend on it. I can't, I can't leave it up to, you know, who knows what's going to be on the menu today. Like that's why I like have to prepare certain meals depending on the day. I'm like, if it's a lot of scenes, if it's a lot of lines to remember, I'm like, I need, I can tell what my body's going to need. So I'm going to cook it <laughs> the night before, eat it cold the next day. I don't care, but I need this type of energy to maintain because it's like a marathon. So you gotta, you gotta get through it um, while giving your best. And like you said, being present, uh, with those scenes that well, you and do. I, I will say too, like I have a unique scope on this because I very much have a real world job in the construction and the trades. Uh, that usually is eight hours a day. It's very, very physically exhausting. It's hard work. It beats up your body. It is not nearly as tiring as acting. Not even close. The, the exhaustion that comes out of perpetuating that flight or, flight or fight response that you, you know, scenes are exciting for a reason because they're supposed to be entertaining to the crowd. Well, when a human body experiences excitement, it has the fight or flight response and it goes through an enormous whirlwind of emotionality. It's way more exhausting. Than Emotionally exhausting, right. Man, when I get back to the hotel room at the end of the day after, after Heartland, even if it was a half day for me, yeah. I am exhausted. white <laughs> compared to the trades. <laughs> yeah, the, the trades are way easier. You're physically sore, but you're... Uh, that that like that that generator is intact inside, yeah. yeah or acting we, depletes it. We talked about that. I think it was years ago. We had this conversation about acting. You know, you show up and you do these scenes. It's very subjective. You don't know if you're like how, if you hit the mark. Like not a clue. I mean, you, you know if you hit the marks the mark mark on the floor. But that, in terms of the scene, like yeah. who knows if it's gonna work? It's not been edited yet. Whereas construction, let's say you're building something, you see it right away. You see it. And it's I'm, done. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You can go home and be like, I did a good job because look, it's right there and it works. Yeah, that's one of the things that for me, doing a lot of sports when I was younger, loving physics and math, not really being into much of the arts at all. It was very challenging at first for my mind to kind of go, Graham, this isn't like, there's no straight A's in acting. There's no like a hundred percent on your test. It's, you just got to surrender and let go and just yeah. do your best. And it's like, and it is exhausting in a completely different completely way, different. completely and different way, almost energizing in the moment and energizing in the moment. But yeah. when you go home, you'll never be more tired. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's something that, uh on set very often, you know, you have such a good time. You're like, hey, let's go hang out, do, yeah. do things after. And then you no. get home, you're like, I'm so tired. Well, I'm going to crash. <laughs> I'm just going to go Remember to bed. Remember how I said, let's get together? And let's not. <laughs> let's <laughs> like, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yo, exactly. So how have you coped? I, I'd say Heartland was a pretty huge transition for me. I mean, you grew up here at the coast. Yeah. Was that confusing for your psyche to suddenly be thrust into, like, well, it's a, it's a different world. Totally. Yeah. I felt, I thought I knew like Albertans, Yeah, you know, I thought I knew what those people were like and, you know, they all voted conservative and, and, and I had a, lots of, you know, preconceived notions just from the culture of the West coast of what Alberta and what Albertans would be like. And then moving there and working there, 
it's like, oh, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Like I, it was, it blew my mind open in so many ways. BC and Alberta are kind of like the equivalent of like California and Texas, but they're right next to each other. Isn't it strange? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can drive 10 hours and you're you're in like the opposite political climate. And so that was very fascinating to be able to, to bounce back in between both of those, meet beautiful, wonderful people. And also meet, you know, eh, kind of people on both, both, both provinces, both places. So it was kind of like a good insight into how easily, and I'm just talking very broad strokes now, but being in both of these provinces quite a bit, is seeing how people's political beliefs largely depend on where they live. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a second, how do I know my approach or my political beliefs are really my own? How do I know they're not just, I'm adopting what is around me is telling me I should think and believe how we should all live together. I don't know if I'm answering your question. What did you ask me? <laughs> no, I love that. That's more fun. Well, it's so interesting too, because everyone, everyone shares the information that they have as though it came from source. Yeah. When often it's just one person's uninformed opinion entirely. Yeah. But then we start to build real opinions based off of that. I think it's crazy just to sit in the middle of it and, and see how caught we can get in political opinions or beliefs or perspectives that we just, we're just adopting because that's what everybody else is doing. We want to fit into our tribe. We want to gel with our tribe. Yeah. It's a pretty natural human state, state of the animal, really. We don't want to stick out. No, you want to mesh with your tribe. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, Don't want to ruffle any feathers. Um, What was your, what did you ask me though? You said, uh, just as far as like coming from the West Coast and moving to Alberta and being there for such a huge and like I mean, you've you've been there through like your early twenties, a hugely yeah. influential time in your life. Yeah. Did you miss home bad? Did you ever wish oh, the show oh, I had see, been I see. from somewhere else? Like, um, so maybe. I mean, does the plaid and blue jeans ever wear on you? <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming back to a party in bc with some friends and they're like why are you like they they, they made a joke or they said something about my head like a plaid shirt on because the way you were dressed <laughs> and i was like i didn't even notice huh. i because like osmosis man you hang yeah, out of course you live in the place and i was living there longer seven months of the year um then i was in bc and it started to you know i started to it started to get into me and i remember them being like well you know you're wearing like cowboy shirts i'm like no this is just it is a it cowboy, is a cowboy shirt. shirt. Oh no, what's happening? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but no, I mean, I think in some ways I missed BC, but I think, you know, the friends, good friends that I have and and I still keep in contact with and in touch with. And when I see them, you know, it's like, oh, hey, there you are. You ever feel cheated out of a regular life? Ooh, good question. I mean, cheated. The seven months of the year of the commitment the Heartland was for you, especially, and like, not so much now. I mean, we're in our 30s, right? Like yeah. When you were like 20 through 23, 24, 25, you know, did you ever wish that you could have those like mess around, explore and make <laughs> some mistakes? Because the truth is, yeah. it's like you... Maybe, but maybe not. Because I feel like in some ways, I might have lost, got too lost in it. Very I cool. think the show in some ways was like a guide rail. You know, some sort of like structure for me. Because you couldn't get too far outside. Yeah. Because yeah. there was opportunities. You know, there's opportunities to get a little crazy, do some things that maybe wouldn't be best. I don't miss it. I don't, I'm not like, oh man, I wish I was 25 and I could have just really got messed up and, and partied really hard. I, I don't, none of that really, I don't feel that. If anything, it was, I think there is so much energy that goes into creating a character and stepping into that world that when I had time off, it was like, read, journal, explore, take courses, like learn, like, you know, come back to breathing life back into my life, that it was, it was okay. I liked that. I enjoyed that. But it, it is a, it is a different way to live, you know, because that was my whole 20s. Like I got Heartland when I was 20 and I'm 33 now, 13 years. And yeah, so all of my 20s was spent on the show. So summers, I was always working. You never had a summer. Never had a summer. No, you should really have sort of. had a summer. I mean, yeah, but I mean like summers like back in high school when you'd be like, oh, it's just, you know, yeah. no school, no, you know. Um, but uh, that's okay. I mean, there was lots of beautiful moments on set because it's such a beautiful location where we film. It is. You know, so there's there's lots of those moments. So I think there's a trade-off. There's trade-offs with everything in life, you know. There's no one life path that you're like, oh, yeah. This is the way to go. There's zero trade-offs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. There's no sacrifices. No, I, you get I it all. You. There's always going to be trade-offs and sacrifices 
whether it's acting or any role, you know, there's going to be more stable and secure jobs, paths of life, but there's a trade-off for that. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, there has to be. Yeah. You can pursue more passionate goals, more, more, um, creative expressions, but there's going to be trade-offs. Yeah. You're going to have to deal with that. And, and I think that's what, um, really life is about is getting down to what trade-offs you want and understanding, you know, if you're going to go for those things that you really believe and you dream that you want to create, you have to be willing to accept what comes with that. And thank God it's that way. Yeah. You know, because if, if there wasn't, if it wasn't that, there'd be so many people just kind of willy nilly like they don't really love it. They don't really care. And they're just trying it because they either want to be famous or they want to be popular or they want to make a ton of money, but they don't have the heart. They don't have the drive to sustain to get through those tough times. So I look at those tough times, those trade-offs as being like the real markers of who really loves it. Cause they stick with it. Yeah. You know, well, and I would argue too, just in the scope of life, like without, if you don't have the right to make choices, if there isn't a consequence to a choice you make and a consequence being as simple as another road that didn't get traveled without that, you aren't actually free. I talked to this, mm. uh, to a few people, um, and, and this, this, well, this is getting pretty uh, out there for maybe some of our listeners, <laughs> but, but even like, uh, I like to boil it down and I use this as a metaphor, not for the actual, um, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not hitting it on the head. It's a metaphor, but heaven and hell. So how long would it take you, Graham Wardle, to be in the perfect setting where you could do whatever you wanted, literally anything you wanted and explore everything safely and you could never get hurt how long would it take you to realize that that is a prison it is a very different prison than hell because hell makes the pain and discomfort obvious but nonetheless this is a big concept you're talking right now it's a prison okay hold on a second so you're saying heaven is a prison yeah because there's no pain because there's no there's no consequence there's no With, consequence without consequence there is no free will without without the the option of having something fail and fall apart in front of you. And that's assuming that heaven doesn't have that. Yes. This is very this is much the assumption of like a very the baseline, very, the very baseline theologian Catholic version of heaven, because I, it relates the metaphor the most to people. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you're saying that in this idea that heaven is like a perfect place where nothing, there's no struggle, there's no pain, there's no consequence. That would actually be a prison. Yeah. Because there would be technically no free will. Mm-hmm. It might take you a thousand years to realize it's a prison, but one day you will, or at least I would. Whoa. Do you think that this is heaven? Yes. This current life is heaven? Yes. And hell. And hell. I don't we make it a heaven or hell. Yep. I think it's a free will zone. And I think that the idea of heaven and hell. Okay. Did you know the earliest, the earliest version of heaven? Or no, no. Sorry. How did this work? The first idea of hell uh, arrived in the 16, I think it was like 1652. It's fairly late in the game, if you think about it, as far as centuries go. So the Where'd you read this? Hold on. Where did you get this? Uh, Somewhere online? <laughs> history stuff. <laughs> history stuff. Yeah. Okay. Not Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go um, ahead. Actually, I think it might have come from Edward Rutherford, who's a historical, um, um, historical fiction author. Okay. But anyways, the first version of hell um, came, it was a, several hundred years earlier than heaven. So the first version huh. of heaven was, uh, and there's actually two paintings depicted of this. The first one is, is heaven is just a banquet. It's just where everybody gets to sit at the table and eat and enjoy dinner together. Hell is the exact same thing because here's the catch. All the spoons and all the forks and all the knives are too long. And this is real. This is the actual original version of heaven and hell. Um, they are the exact same place with the exact same meals. In heaven, everybody's feeding each other. In hell, everyone's trying to figure out how to use their long utensils themselves. That's it. Jeez. 1652. That that reminds me of a photograph I've seen of... That is the photo you're thinking That's of, the photograph. Where they're all trying to... They're all they're trying all, to... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, Neat, damn. Hey? That was the first ever version of hell. It wasn't called hell or chosen for a few hundred years later. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Well, I know a lot of the stories, the origin stories of a lot of different religions. I know Joseph Campbell talked about this. Yeah. They all have very similar origin stories of how humanity started well it's because they weren't originally intended they're stories humans tell stories to convey information these stories are all about the internal workings of how to be a healthy human being and to tell that in an interesting way we used we take superhero or do deity like qualities 
because it gets the message across. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, most men, the Hindu mythology is fantastical and fun, but it openly acknowledges itself as like, this is all a metaphor for what's going on inside of you, mm -hmm. in your own psyche. Mm -hmm. The point isn't actually, it, they're no different than comic books. You read a comic book, it's not really about how strong the hero is. It's about him and, and who he is and what he struggles with. And the, and the evil supervillain is always just representing the shadows that he doesn't. And he has to go through and find out how to come to terms with it all to save the world, which is a save his own life. Say, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what it all boils down to. That's what, I, that's what I personally love about story is that it's a, a gateway or a key or a helpful tool, technology that we get to be a part of that unlocks people's potential, unlocks yes. their key back to come home yes. to themselves and be empowered. And I feel like, you know, it can, you know, not always, but it can be, um, uh, what's the word, like lost. And it can, like you say, get caught in the business. And it's all about creating the hook for the next episode to keep people watching so you can keep getting paid. Yeah. And it's like, man, the stories that we tell are meant to bring people back to themselves and empower them and wake them up. Well, not keep them trapped like in even, a fictional reality. <laughs> like the Ten Commandments. If you read them and take the word commandment out of them and add the ten ideas to run past yourself every morning before you start your day, you have ten healthy questions to reflect off of yourself to see if there's anything you can do better about who you are. Mm. Wake up in the morning. Am I a glutton? Am I trying to covet my, my, my neighbor's wife causing strife where mm. I shouldn't? Mm. Like, have I stolen? Am I going down a path where I might murder? That's all. There are 10 suggestions for how to be healthier. Points of contemplation. That, that's, thank you. That, that's yeah. a really beautiful way of putting it. They're points of contemplation yeah. for self-reflection. Do you believe that Moses, some, you ever heard the story that Moses got it from aliens? I have. Did you hear that, that story? <laughs> I also heard that actually that there's a, there's a certain type of um, solar flare that can exist um, that actually with the way it would have pulled on our on our poles at that time, that that river actually could have emptied out in at that time period. And there was even... By chance? And Moses just happened to tune into that and be like... Tsh. Maybe. Wow, man. Can you imagine how great he would have felt? Be like, damn. <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe they all crossed the river days before and then the event uh, happened. Yeah. It just got scribed the way it did. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. Cool. Well, there's... um. There's one question that uh, I've probably asked you this before, but I'm, I'm going to create a, a sort of a, a ritual in this podcast where I ask this question at the end of the, of the show because I, I love this question. So you've probably already answered it, but I'll, I'll love for you to answer it again in okay. this moment. <laughs> and uh, if you remember, it's that question about the magic painting. You remember, did I ever ask you this I question? Don't, I don't know the magic okay, painting. Okay, great. One. Okay, good. So uh, I came up with this question on set way back in the day. We were out at Heartland shooting. Uh, Devorah was there, a costume, on-set costumer at the time. And we were really bored, you know, between scenes. And so this question has kind of popped into my head just for fun to start conversation. And it was really interesting when I asked people this question because their answers were so unique. So here's the question. If you could have in your house, anywhere in your house, you get one of these paintings. It's a magic painting. Um, and it could be an object too. It doesn't have to be a painting. But for the sake of this question, a painting that whenever you look at it, you can feel any emotion that you want to feel to any degree that you want to feel it, okay? What emotion would you choose and what color or colors would you want uh, on that painting to represent that for you? Oh, wow, that is an interesting question. Any emotion and all assume sensations are different than emotions. So it has to be either joy, I suppose, love, no, love is more of an event than an emotion. It's sadness, love, anger's just anger's sadness. an emotion, but it's, it's I, more normally masking things. But. I was going to say it's more of a, it's more of a um, I don't know, it's too much sadness not dealt with mm. leads to that. Could be, yeah. Man, why would I pick? I don't know. That's a really hard question. I know because I'm like, what? What? And I could just feel it anytime I wanted. For as long as I wanted. Yeah so, yeah, so you could just like wake up in the morning and be like, there's my magic painting. I want to feel five out of ten joy. <sighs> that joy. And you walk away. <laughs> um, okay, I'm trying to block choose? out my joke answers. <laughs> <laughs> you can say those too. <laughs> uh, uh, can I pick horniness? Like, it's like, <laughs> you have to look at a painting to feel that? No, no, no. But you could turn it off in the morning oh. and start your day. Like, you know what? I don't want to really shut this down. Okay, let's go start my day. <laughs> um... 
You know what, man? I think just joy. I just love joy, to, okay. I just to laugh. And I don't know. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be very funny if the, if the painting was a very, like the colors were very paradoxical to joy. I mean, cause that would just make me laugh harder. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like something kind of like just ominous and off putting and sort of not really very pretty. But then when you looked at it, you just start howling. <laughs> like that sounds pretty good. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be kind of fun. Okay. Oh, sh- oh, hold on a second. I unplug my headphones. <laughs> technical difficulties and I'm back. Um, okay. So I want to dive into this just a tiny bit more. So it's joy. It's got obtuse colors or colors that don't match yeah, yeah. what you th- most people would think joy and is it's like, like, it's like a kid holding like a limp flower and he's like, Ugh. and it's like a gray day. But you just feel <laughs> great when you see this thing. You're like, I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Now, uh, I want to dive into this a bit more. If you could, if you had to explain that feeling of joy to somebody who's never felt that before, how would you explain it? Okay, it's like you're trying to be very serious and you're at a meeting and a bunch of invisible people that can't stop laughing are just kind of like squeezing your thighs and they won't stop and they're doing it really fast and hard. So you just got like that massive inner squirm going on where you're just like, oh, I can't even take it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the sensation. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Okay, so what I love about it is this, this level of like, since like taking life too seriously. Yeah, that's make, that makes and it, then so it makes funny. it makes it so funny. Yeah. So it's a feeling of joy that that erupts from taking life too seriously. Very much so. Yeah. Wow. Like you just can't keep it down. But you want to, but you're going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, like there's been times where you and I have been on set <laughs> and we're doing scenes that are otherwise supposed to be very serious. And then that thing happens and we're like, I don't know, man, where <laughs> laughter is contagious and you can't, you can't stop, stop laughing. anymore. And you're literally, you're costing people <sighs> time and money and energy. And you're like, I'm so, so sorry, everybody. I really am out of control right now. That's uh, <laughs> the sensation it would give you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is awesome. So one of the things that I've been thinking about when I ask this question is how do you, how do you seek this out in your everyday life? Because we don't have that magic painting on your wall. So how do you take those moments of that finding that joy does it come up sporadically yes like sporadically you yeah. know when people like often uh, you this must happen for you and it must happen to tons of listeners like where you see something that otherwise was very normal and nothing weird really happened like ordering a coffee or something like that but for a, a fraction of a second you see the youtube video version of it like with an <laughs> snl or kids in the hall kind of twist okay and yeah okay. just i just i kill myself in public sometimes <laughs> over this stuff so do you when you write do you have that feeling in mind do you chase that feeling do you take that feeling that you're fe- this this feeling of joy and do you, you know, infuse that into your writing i don't think i've ever written anything where i don't feel what the character i'm writing about is feeling yeah no matter what it is so yeah, I was working on one movie, which I never actually finished, but it was a buddy sci-fi comedy. I told you about that in Calgary. Yeah. I howled through writing that yeah. because the characters were laughing and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. You should make it, man. Oh, it's you... almost done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I just never finished it. Yeah. Are you going to finish it? I should. You yeah. should. Yeah. Now don't shit all over yourself. You're going to. No, <laughs> I will. I will. Yeah, yeah. dude. Yeah. That'd be fun. Um, well, thanks uh, for coming on the podcast, Carrie. I really appreciate it. Oh, we'll have to do pleasure, this again. Yeah, Next time on you're on the island, we'll come out again. Dude, I'd love to. Do another episode. Yeah, this was awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Also, you're really good at this. Oh, thanks, dude. Yeah, I'm 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 tr- I'm learning, you know, having yeah. fun with it. <laughs> well, you're very natural at it. Oh, thanks, dude. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Uh well, um, you can join us again. Our next guest, my good old friend uh Jaron Meche. He's gonna be on the podcast next. So you look forward to that and thanks for listening. Cheers, guys. I always have a good time talking to Carrie James. That was a fun podcast for me. And before you go, I just want to let you know about the intro music by Eskimotion. The song is called In Dreams. If you haven't checked them out yet, you can go on Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, whatever you use for your music services, and check them out. That's E-S-K-I-M-O-T-I-O-N, and the song is called In Dreams. He's got a bunch of stuff on there. I love it. It's very peaceful and relaxing kind of music. And that's the kind of stuff I like to listen to sometimes. Puts me in a good mood, just, you know, sets me at ease and makes me connect deeper to life. So thank you to Eskimotion for letting me use the music in my intro to my podcast. And I also want to tell you a bit about these boxers that I wear that block over 99% of electromagnetic fields. And they're great because if you haven't already heard about them, they stop these fields from interacting with your body in a negative way. Now, you can check out all the science online on their website, getlambs.com, 
and they have all the research and studies cited there, so it's not just uh, wishful thinking. It actually works, and I've tested it myself and proven it. So I have a little meter that tests uh, the different uh, electromagnetic field radiation coming from your cell phone, and uh, I've tested them, and it works, which is great because I used to put my phone on airplane mode when I put it in my pocket, and now I don't have to because I know that my boxers with the silver lining in the threads in the boxers, which they feel regular like regular boxers. You can't tell the difference, but with the silver in the in the fabric, it blocks these radio uh, frequencies, or I should say these electromagnetic fields from interacting with your body and reducing sperm counts and damaging different uh, cells and such like this. You know, I've seen the studies and I trust them and I like the product and I've done my own little test. So I'm like, you know what? I want to have kids in the future. So I'm going to protect my little warriors for future conquest. So, because I want them to be happy and healthy and be to be vibrant when they go out to uh, do their business. So that's what I wear. That's actually the only kind of boxer I wear. So if you're into that, you can go to getlambs.com and enter the promo code time has come and you'll get 15% off. You'll help out the show, which I really appreciate. And that's it, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Once again, I wish you love, peace, success. All the best. Cheers.